Welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you're enjoying build stuff and uh, we're getting towards the end, um, but this I hope will keep you energized. Uh, my name is Sasha Goldstein and I'm uh, the CTO of uh, an Israeli training company. Uh, we do consulting and training and I'm here to talk to you about Linux uh, tracing tools. Um, so just last week I was giving this talk in, uh, at another conference right uh, the day after the US elections and I was all like make Linux tracing great again and people were all like oh. and um, so th I'm not going to just try that here but in any case uh, I do believe that uh, Linux is, is reaching the point um, where we can really make tracing tools and get info out of tracing tools that it was a little hard to get before uh, or we had to pay a lot of overhead to achieve. Um, currently, the state of the tools I'm going to show you, some of them are in pretty good shape, uh, can be used in production, absolutely supported on older uh, systems as well, and some of them are pretty brand new, uh, bleeding edge, you need very, very recent Linux kernels to use them, and so you might actually be able to put them to use only, say, next year or in a few months, but it's still good to know what's, uh, what's coming. Uh, oops, just blanked the screen. So what's uh, on the agenda is a brief overview of what I mean by tracing and what kind of technologies are in the box. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the modern tracing tools uh, like Perf and others. And uh, like the, the bigger message I want you to take, uh, which we'll spend about 20 or 25 minutes on, is that there's a new player, a new superpower to Linux tracing, performance analysis, investigation, and that's BPF, Berkeley Packet Filters. Um, we'll see why packet filters have anything to do with tracing and understand what this technology is about and see a bunch of ready-made tools that you can use today to, to make tracing great. So what do I mean by tracing exactly? Um, roughly, I mean the ability to attach to various places in the system and collect information. It could be a function execution, the arguments a certain function is getting, uh, interesting places in the kernel like uh, network packets coming in or processes being created, application level events like garbage collections or uh, expensive method invocations. And whenever something interesting like that occurs, I'd like to be able to print a message, that's just classic tracing and logging, I'd like to be able to gather some statistics, like how long has it taken the system on average to process network packets, or to create a process, or to run a garbage collection in this and that Java process. So various tracing points around the system could be instrumented, and I could collect uh, just general statistics or a specific list of events, why by, one by one. And what's very important when doing tracing, as a lot of you probably discovered, is that you need to keep the tracing tools themselves to a low overhead. If your tracing tool slows, uh, slows down the system, if your measurement tool slows down the measured application, it's really sort of worthless. And we need tools that can run continuously in production as well as development, so really overhead is out of the question. We need tools with very low overhead. Hope this is all uh, agreed upon. So this is a diagram of some of the more common, more well-known Linux tracing tools. And there's three dimensions here. Uh, I know it's a lot after lunch, but still, like one dimension is just how easy the tool is to use. That's the uh, vertical axis. And then uh, the other dimension is how detailed the information you can get from that tool is. So how low level it is, how detailed stuff you can uh, retrieve. And the third dimension is the color here. Is this a new technology? Is it a stable technology? Or is it pretty much sort of dead? Uh, it's, of course, arguable whether something is dead or not, but it's pretty, uh, that, that's what I wanted to convey. Uh, so just a couple of examples, which I'll be showing you, and a couple I will not. Uh, there's Perf, for example. Perf uh, is sort of uh, smack down the middle. It's uh, pretty easy to use, but not ideal. There's a lot of front ends to Perf. It's part of the system, it's built with the Linux uh, kernel tree, so it's relatively easy to get whenever, whatever distribution you're on. Um, it can get pretty much uh, everything out of the system, but there's some limitations in terms of uh, what kind of aggregations you can perform, for example. So it's powerful, but not super powerful. 
And the general trend is it's a stable tool and it's getting easier to use. So that's that's the, what this picture is all about, that, these dimensions. Um, one other example before we get to the, uh, to the most recent stuff, uh, there's system tap which has also been around for ages. This is not part of Linux. It's being developed separately. A uh, pretty cool project which basically builds custom little drivers that run on the system and uh, collect information dynamically. System tap is fairly stable. It's kind of easy to use. Uh, there's a scripting language that you have to figure out, but otherwise it's okay. Um, and it's really in-depth. You can collect a lot of very, very detailed information uh, about your system using system tap. And finally, another contender that's showing up lately is uh, BPF, which is a kernel technology you can use for tracing, and a bunch of front ends on top of that. So there's BCC, which I'll be showing you. You can write C code yourself to talk to BPF. There's a project called Ply, which is under development uh, and has its own uh, sort of custom language. So this is the new contender, which is trying to take over Linux tracing. That's the superpower I was talking about. And uh, it's brand new, it's very powerful, but it's kind of hard to use yet. So that's sort of, again, uh, the trade-off we'll be making. I'll show you examples of perf, I'll show you examples of ftrace, which I haven't talked about. I'll show you a lot of examples of BCC as well, so you can get a general picture of what the tracing tools are like. As with a lot of things Linux, there are multiple tools for every problem, and there's, of course, a lot of uh, discussion uh, which tools are the best for each problem, so we're not going to try and do that here, right? I'm just going to show you the options. Okay. Um, so let's talk briefly about the underlying kernel technologies which make tracing possible, and then I'll show you a bunch of tools that extract information from the system. I'll start with uh, fairly low-level stuff uh, on the kernel level. So in the kernel, there's a mechanism that's been in Linux for at least 10 years called trace points. These are statically defined places in the kernel which will do something when you hit that point. So a little like a breakpoint, except it doesn't break, it can optionally trace a message or do something interesting. There's uh, thousands of these on a typical Linux system. Um, I can show you a partial list. So um, if you just go on your system to sys kernel debug tracing, uh, there's a file over here called available events. And on my system, it's got uh, seven, uh, 1,715 events. That's the number of trace points I have on this Linux kernel. Um, and these are really varied. So there's stuff like uh, uh, scheduler events, whenever you create a new process, whenever you switch between processes, whenever you do a fork. There's uh, network level events like packets coming in, packets going out. There's file system and, and block I.O. level events like uh, uh, file I.O. being issued, writes, reads, and so on. There's a separate trace point for each syscall. So every system call like write, open, read, fork again, you can trace a bunch of those. And we can attach pretty much all the tracing tools I was talking about to these trace points and get interesting information. There's also something, something sort of similar for user space, for user applications. So again, statically defined trace points for user applications are embedded in runtimes like the Java runtime, the Python runtime, the PHP runtime. There's a bunch of these trace points there as well. So for example, for Java, there's a trace point whenever you call a method, whenever you do a garbage collection, whenever you create a new thread. For uh, Ruby, there's a trace point whenever you create a new object, whenever you call a method, whenever you load a module, or whatever they're called in Ruby. I don't do a lot of Ruby. Um, so there's trace points like that in higher level languages as well. Um, that's one technology that allows tracing, that makes tracing possible. Ftrace, which is the first tool I'm going to show you, is capable of attaching to these trace points and getting out information. It's a very, very fundamental kernel mechanism. It's been, again, in Linux for at least 10 years, and it's all based on the file system. So this directory I, I previously changed into, the, the syskernel debug tracing, all of ftrace is based on that. You basically write into these special files, which aren't really files, uh, it's debugfs, and you read from these special files, which aren't really files, and that's how you get trace information out of the kernel. So uh, I'll show you a couple of examples, uh, which I have over here. Uh, 
So I'm going to run just this whole thing, which, as you can see, switches over to syskernel debug tracing, and then it writes into a few files. So it, it writes one into a file called tracing on. It writes one into a file called uh, events my probe enable. And importantly, it creates a new probe, a new trace thing, if you will, uh, by writing this expression into a file called kprobe events. And what this expression basically says is, whenever the open system call is hit, I would like to print out the file name being opened. So this is essentially a tool for tracing all file open operations on the system. And ftrace can take filters as well. So I could have done something like, I would like to trace file opens only in this directory, or only by this specific PID, or only when the system call failed. So only failed file opens. This can be pretty powerful. So let me just run this whole thing uh, up to here. Um, so there's been a bunch of events, and uh, as you can see, what I have in that special file I'm reading are these nicely formatted lines that have the process name, the process ID, uh, a timestamp, my probe name, which is called my probe, and towards the end, there's the file name being opened. So uh, if I were to go here and uh, run curl, uh, there is a bunch of files being opened. Uh, among others, you'll see etc hosts and a bunch of uh, uh, shared objects being loaded as a result of running curl. I just ran curl because it was out there in my shell, no particular reason. Um, so this is like a very crude way of getting uh, data out of the system. And I guess, unsurprisingly, people built front-ends on top of that. So for example, there's a front-end called trace-cmd, trace-cmd which just sort of wraps this whole thing. So you don't have to write these obscure lines into obscure files and then read obscure uh, text output, but rather something a little more friendly. Now, I mean, I, I won't actually ask you this question directly, but I want you to think for a second. Um, this whole approach is based on reading a lot of stuff from some magical file. Can you imagine, like, if, if there's a large number of events, can you imagine a certain performance problem looming in the background, right? So uh, there's this magical file that we're reading, say, millions of events from and doing something with them, but basically do any kind of processing of these events, like statistics, which files are being opened a lot, that kind of thing, you would need to fetch all this information into your app and parse it, aggregate, do something. So you have to transfer a very large number of events from the kernel, which is where the events are happening, to user space where we can analyze that magical file. Um, this is rather inefficient. And uh, indeed, ftrace is good if your events are not happening very frequently, but if you have millions of events, this is a pretty expensive approach. And in fact, until BPF showed up, uh, pretty much all the Linux tracing tools had this disadvantage. You'd have to generate a lot of data, put it in a file, or, or this magical file, and then you'd be able to do analysis. And this is, for certain kinds of workloads, very, very prohibitive. OK, now we'll talk about something slightly different. Um, again, as, as a tracing mechanism built into the kernel and then a tool that can use it, uh, there is a mechanism in the kernel called k-probes and u-probes. These have also been around for a while, so k-probes for at least 10 years and u-probes since, I think, Linux 3.10, so also not, for, not very new. Um, these can be used to probe, to place a trace point like that, dynamically. So instead of the trace points statically embedded in the kernel or in some le user level runtime, you can basically pick any function you want without any preparation beforehand and at runtime attach a trace program to that function. It can be a user space function, which is what U probes are about, or it can be a kernel space function in a, ker in a kernel module or the kernel itself. The instrumentation technique used here 
is uh, slightly different from what a debugger does or what ptrace does, if you know about ptrace. It doesn't uh, context switch out of the program. It basically replaces the thing you want to probe with a jump instruction that jumps to a handler. So it's, it's like the, the, the least overhead you could possibly achieve. You just basically replace the thing you're tracing with a direct jump to uh, a handler. Uh, again, if you have millions of events per second, that's eventually going to add up to some overhead, but it's, it's a very efficient way of figuring out that an event occurred. So uh, one of the ways, again, we're switching to a tool, one of the ways we can extract that kind of information out of the system is using a kernel mechanism called perf events. It also gives us access to a lot of interesting event sources in addition to k-probes and u-probes. This is part of the Linux kernel. It's built with the Linux kernel tree. And there's a front end, again, I'm going to talk about called perf, which is a very, uh, uh, very powerful command, essentially, that you can use to get tracing information out of your system. So it can attach to k-probes and u-probes, but there's also some other kinds of interesting events. For example, you can attach to CPU events, like cache misses or branch miss predictions. So if you saw the, the CPU internals talk yesterday, you can trace these uh, events happening in a particular program by using perf on Linux. Um, another example is timer-based sampling, which I'll show you right now. So you can attach to an interrupt that happens periodically. Like uh, a thousand times a second, you get an interrupt, and perf will collect which application was running, what the call stack was, and give you an idea of what's taking a lot of time in your application. That's what I'm going to uh, show you next. So here are some of the things that you can trace using perf. Um, this is a standard diagram. I'll have another one of those uh, that Brendan Gregg uh, popularized. It's a basic Linux architecture diagram uh, that shows a bunch of different tools and techniques that can extract information from the system. So there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of techniques. We're not going to go into everything uh, right now. But you see a variety of, the, of event sources. There's stuff coming from the CPU. There's file system level events, application events, networking, and so on and so forth. So let's uh, take a brief look at perf and um, how to use that to collect interesting trace information. So here I just ran perf to show some of the uh, command line options it has. It's a, it's a multi-tool. It's a Swiss Army knife uh, with a lot of li different little knives and, and tools. Uh, very, very powerful and a little hard to use, but some of the basic scenarios are pretty easy and that's what I'll show you. Um, important to remember, this has the same disadvantage as ftrace. It collects information, puts it in a file, and then you have to run a tool to post-process the file and get actual performance insight. Uh, the file is called perf.data. Um, it's still a file. So you can potentially get uh, gigabytes of events, which you'll have to then post-process. So the way we're going to visualize these uh, gigabytes of events is by using a fairly popular approach, which is getting more and more popular on Linux tracing, called flame graphs. I hope some of you have seen flame graphs before. If not, just a very, very quick introduction. It's an approach for visualizing complex data, for visualizing complex stack traces. Basically, you have stack traces for millions, potentially billions of events. And you want to figure out quickly which functions, which components, which stack traces were responsible for most of these events. So the way a flame graph works, here's an example of a flame graph, is the wider something is, the more prominent it was, the more time or events happened in that module or in that function. And then uh, the color is just usually random. And um, the x-axis is, uh, the, sorry, the, yes, the y-axis is the stack trace. So whenever something is on top of something else, it was called by that something. I'll, I'll just show you an example. Uh, so before we switch to BPF, a quick demo of that. So what I'm going to do here uh, is run uh, DD to just uh, copy bytes from uh, uh, dev0 to dev null, uh, a, a lot of bytes. And then in the background, I'm going to run perf record. And uh, what the flags here do, so the dash F says, I want to sample the CPU. I want to collect 97 times per second what the CPU is doing, what the current call stack is. Uh, the dash AG says collect information for all the processors and collect a stack trace, not just where we are right now. 
And then the command itself, which we are uh, waiting for, is just sleep for five seconds. So I run DD and then I sleep for five seconds just in case DD takes longer. Uh, and then we do some post-processing to turn that recording, perf.data, into a flame graph, into an image. And this, uh, this whole process of turning perf.data into an image is basically, as you can see, a mishmash of scripts. So you take uh, the original file, you run it through perf, then you run it through one Perl script, then you run it through another Perl script, and at the end, you get uh, a visualization. Okay, so let's, um, let's run this thing. <coughs> You'll also be able to see uh, the, the file size. So we got, uh, you can see up here on top, uh, 1,476 samples of the CPU, and that's just uh, some 300 kilobytes. Not, you know, not a lot of information. And uh, the end result of, the, of all this uh, is a file called uh, flame.svg, oops, uh, which is right down there in my uh, home directory. So I'm just gonna quickly upload that because I'm in a VM and I can't copy files out because I updated my kernel. Never mind, you don't care about that. Uh, so I'm gonna upload that file uh, to transfer.sh. Just in case you haven't seen this, you can just basically upload files to transfer.sh and, and then you get a link you can access anywhere, which is pretty handy. Um, so yeah, let's just grab a web browser and take a look at what we got. I'm just gonna zoom in on this, which is fine. Um, so this is a flame graph. And again, the colors, you can ignore the colors, they're just there so you can visually distinguish the different parts. Um, but you can see there's three major stacks there. Uh, there's this one here from the swapper. There's this one here from, uh, I can't actually see, from start kernel. And there's another one over here from uh, libc read. So that's probably my DD reading uh, from dev zero. Um, and you can see later it's going through VFS read and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so this, this is a trace that starts in user space, starts in DD, and then there's three major uh, forks, right? So there's this stack over here, which takes about a third of my time, and these two other stacks as well. This works for kernel functions, as well as user space functions, um, and if you want this to work for Java, for Python, for other languages that aren't just plain C, you will need to use some external tool for debug information. So you can see uh, function names and class names rather than just addresses. But that's out of scope right now. If you just go to uh, the, the GitHub repo for flame graphs, you'll find a lot more info on how to use flame graphs from, uh, from different languages. Uh, I just wanted to show you an example of perf. So we collected information, put it in a file, and then did some post-processing to get this nice visualization of where our application is spending time. This is all fun and games, but it's again based on putting a lot of stuff in a file and then post-processing that file. It will not fly for larger uh, overhead, for, for larger frequency events, uh, like network packets being received. You could have billions of packets in just a minute, and there's just no way you're gonna store them to a file and analyze them later. Also, this whole approach is not very suitable for continuous monitoring. This is designed to run a trace, collect information, and then post-process it. If you want results in real time, you'd have to, I guess, uh, do windows, right? Like uh, process 20 seconds, get a result, do another 20 seconds, get a result. You'd have to build a pipeline like that on top. What I'm gonna talk about next, and this is, uh, this is pretty much what I want to get you excited about, is BPF. Uh, this is a kernel technology that's uh, emerging and making it possible to build tracing tools which do not require putting everything in a file and post-processing that file later. So I'll start with just a tad of history, uh, really a, a bit of history. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filters. It's been around for more than Linux itself, um, and it's designed for packet filtering. So you can uh, do these expressions, these totally stateless queries, like uh, the destination port is port 80, and the packet length is more than 100 bytes, and uh, like the third packet is the letter H, that, that kind of thing. 
And then you can apply that filter, for example, in Wireshark or TCP dump or other tools to do something with these packets. You could record them, you can drop packets not matching a certain filter. That's what it is, filters. Um, now, packet filtering, dropping, recording has to be pretty efficient. So over the years, the kernel developed a way to compile these expressions into machine code. So instead of parsing that expression and then executing it at runtime, it's just compiled down to machine instructions on the more uh, popular architectures like x86, x64, ARM, Power, and so on. Um, so these are essentially little programs that you can load into the kernel and they execute at machine speed. But, I mean, this is just for packet filtering, right? So what happened next is extended BPF. Uh, which brings the power of this little uh, device, which you can load stuff into the kernel with, to other stuff. So in addition to just packet filtering, you can do, for example, virtual networking. Like, you can decide how traffic gets routed using uh, these packet filters. You can do security, like you could at runtime inspect the system calls your applications are making and decide should this be allowed, should this not be allowed. So this is used by SecComp in Linux, for example. And most importantly for us, this is used by tracing. You can now attach tracing programs using this BPF syntax. So essentially what happens is that in user space, you'd have a program generate from a higher level language these BPF instructions, which are not just uh, stateless uh, filters anymore. It's actually a little language. It's sort of like the Java bytecode, except a little more limited in scope. And then that gets loaded into the kernel. In the kernel, there's a verifier, which doesn't allow just anything to be loaded like that. Importantly, it makes sure that two important things hold. One, the program can't access arbitrary memory. So you can't just load into the kernel something that would crash with a seg fault because it accesses like an invalid address or writes to an invalid address, which can be even worse. And the second property is you can't have loops. So you can't do, uh, you can't hang your system by loading a program that does an infinite loop. So there are certain restrictions which the kernel verifies before it loads that little program and lets it run at machine speed. And then there's a BPF engine in the kernel that executes these programs. And again, they're not stateless anymore. They can update data structures called maps. And these are essentially key value hash tables, uh, basically. These hashes can be used for histograms, for just plain data, aggregations, whatever you want, and I'll show you multiple examples. The data sources you can get information from are the same mechanisms we discussed. So it's starting to pay off. You can attach a BPF program to K probes and U probes, which are just arbitrary kernel functions. You can attach them to trace points in the kernel. You can also attach them to user level events, like uh, garbage collections in a Java process, or Python method calls, or that kind of thing. And the results are stored in these maps and can be pushed to user space for aggregation, statistics, analysis, whatever. Importantly, there is no file. There is no perf.data. There is no trace pipe. There is no huge file with millions of events that you have to parse in user space to get results. You can do all the aggregations right where the events are happening. So if I want to count the number of incoming network packets, I don't have to store all the packets to a file. I can just increment a counter from my little BPF program. This is revolutionary. Um, I know it may sound like an exaggeration, uh, but this has been something that tracing tools have been suffering from for ages. And we can now build tracing tools that are uh, by far more efficient and more powerful than what we had before. So how do you build these tools? We're going to use, for the purpose of this talk, a library that I'm also contributing to called BCC. This is the BPF compiler collection. It is essentially a module, a user space module that simplifies the process of writing your own BPF programs. You don't have to know what the BPF instruction set is all about. You can use Python, you can use Lua, and uh, you will be able, in the very near future, be able to use C++ as well, if that's what you like. 
<coughs> so you build a tracing tool using these languages, and BCC takes care of loading it into the kernel, transferring data back and forth, a lot of the infrastructure, essentially. There's other front ends like this as well, but BCC is the one I like, and that's why I'm, I'm telling you about it. Here are some of the tools we have in BCC. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to say I wrote a couple of those. Um, again, this is Brendan Gregg's classic diagram, which shows uh, dozens of different tools tracing various areas of the system built on top of BCC. The only disadvantage you have to know about it, it, it would be dishonest if I didn't tell you about it, is that this is only available in fairly new kernels. Some of these tools will require kernel 4.1, some of these tools will require 4.4, and some of these tools will require 4.7, which has just come out like a couple of months ago. Um, so it will take a little time before it just bubbles down to all the major distributions. Uh, but say Ubuntu 16 has Linux 4.4, which means you can use a lot of these tools there. And uh, some of you might be able to build your own kernels or upgrade the kernel in the distro you're using. So um, hopefully this will be useful uh, immediately. But if not, this, these tools are the future of tracing. Bear that in mind. Um, this is just a list of tools instead of the diagram. Again, just to show you the sheer number of uh, tools we have. And this is a general performance checklist, so, so how you'd use these tools to start investigating a performance issue on Linux, essentially, uh, some of the basics. I'll just mention a few of those, and then I'll show you a big demo when I run a few tools and explain some output and so on. Um, so, for example, exec snoop is a pretty simple tool that prints out whenever something gets exec. So essentially, any program you run, you can get a printout when it happens. Open snoop is pretty similar to what we did with ftrace. It prints out something, it prints out a message whenever a file gets opened, and uh, you can use it to filter for only failures or a specific PID, that kind of thing. Another example uh, are the TCP-related tools. So TCP connect and TCP accept trace client or server level TCP events. TCP connect traces whenever you connect to a, to a remote TCP endpoint, and TCP accept traces whenever you get uh, an accept, an incoming connection. Uh, again, these are not TCP dump based tools. We're not uh, dumping all the packets to a file, post processing them, printing events. Rather, we are attaching to the underlying function in the kernel that gets invoked whenever we connect or accept a connection. Um, one final example from this list is profile, which is essentially a replacement for perf, uh, for what we did with perf. Uh, you use the profile tool to figure out where you're spending time where what are the hot stacks in your program, and you can use it to generate uh, flame graphs as well. So this is just some of the tools, and you can see there's a variety of areas you could focus on, networking, file systems, uh, scheduling, uh, CPU work, that kind of thing. Uh, I've also been building for a while a set of user space tracing tools for Java, for Python, so I'll, I, I'll show you an example or two uh, right now. Okay, so here are some of the um, BCC tools I want to show you. I'll probably start with exec snoop because that's uh, fairly useful. Uh, so exec snoop is a little tool that just runs there and it will print whenever I exec something, it will print what it was. Uh, so let me go over here and do an ls and you can see here it prints ls. This is the PID, this is the parent PID. Uh, that exec was successful, so the return value was zero. And if there had been any arguments, I'd, seen them here, I'd see them here as well. Um, so that's pretty simple. Another example is a file slower, which is uh, slightly more interesting. So this is a tool that traces all file I.O. on your system. By default, it takes, uh, uh, sorry, by default, it would only trace slow operations, slower than a certain threshold. But when I said file slower uh, zero uh, over here, it prints just basically everything. Uh, so let me do something with a file. So here you can see all the file I.O.s that occurred uh, as I ran cat in that other shell. Uh, so Bash had to do some operations reading from cat itself in order to launch it, I suppose. Uh, and then cat itself was reading from my file in order to print it. So you can trace uh, file I.O. operations, or if I wanted to, I could only trace slow ones to identify bottlenecks in my system. 
Okay, uh, a totally different example is stack count, which is a more powerful tool. What stack count does is it attaches to a certain event. In this case, it's a scheduler event called sched switch, whenever you switch between threads. And whenever that happens, it grabs a stack trace. And then it tries to tell you what the more common stack traces were. So let's see uh, how that works. So stack count is running. Uh, let me do something in the background, like again, uh, maybe uh, DD a couple of times. Go back here and control C. And you can see there's a list of call stacks in uh, increasing order of importance. So what you see towards the end, that's the more common call stack that called <coughs> my, my trace point, uh, the, the scheduler switch event. Um, so these are kernel stack traces. There's uh, explicit calls to the schedule function. There's uh, the nano sleep function call, which causes a context switch, right? If you sleep, the thread gets uh, switched out. There's calls to uh, select, right? Which is basically used for waiting. So you can see stacks leading up to a thread getting switched out. And the frequency, the number of times that happened, is printed down here. So you can identify common stack traces leading to a particular event. These were all uh, fairly low-level kernel examples. Let me show you a couple of things from user space. So this is bash. Um, <coughs> what we're doing here is attaching to a function in the bash executable called readLine. This function in Bash is responsible for reading user input from the shell. And then whenever Bash read line returns, we would like to print the return value as a string. Well, guess what? When read line returns, the return value is the user input. Um, so let me run this thing. It's running over here. Now let me switch over to that other shell, and uh, I'll do ls and cat. And uh, you can just see uh, me tracing wh whatever I'm typing into that bash shell. And uh, importantly, this is not just for this shell over here. It also, uh, yep, it also works on that other shell, which is even running as root, right? So we have just attached to all the bash shells and whenever a user types something in, we print it out. This is suspiciously dangerous. Um, and so the only, uh, <coughs> the only thing I can tell you is that in order to load a BPF program for tracing, you need root. So you know, as root, you can spy on other users. This is uh, unsurprising. Um, so whenever read line returns, we just print out whatever that returned. This is still fairly low level because Bash is a C application. Let's try something slightly higher level. So this here is Node. Node is instrumented with user level trace points. Uh, for example, whenever a node accepts an HTTP request, you can trace that and print, for example, where you're connecting from and what the HTTP request was. So let me run this example over here. And in this shell, I have node running. And in this shell, let's run curl. Oops, not the upload. Uh, rather, the, the other curl. Ah, just they're directly localhost 8080 foo foo. OK, so in that traced program, uh, you can see the time, the PID, the process uh, name, node, and then HTTP server request was invoked. And we got a GET request for fufu uh, from this IP address. It's IPv6 from this port. Um, let me do something else. A, equal, uh, a B equals C. Y you see we get the uh, HTTP uh, request information. Um, so node just happened to be instrumented with a trace point that we managed to trace. But even if node wasn't, even if node didn't have that trace point, <coughs> we could still use U probes to attach to functions in the node process um, and trace them even without any preparation on node's uh, behalf. OK, let me terminate this. Uh, one other example. So, uh, and this is one of the newer tools. It hasn't even been merged yet. I have an open PR for this. Um, so this is a tool I called Objnew, which traces object allocations. 
Um, and in this case, we're running it on a Ruby process. So whenever that Ruby process allocates, uh, we get uh, the allocated object and the, the, the size of that object for some types. Uh, this tool also supports Java and um, uh, malloc directly. So let me run this. And over here, nope, over here, nope, over here, over there, somewhere here in one of these, I should have, I should have had um, uh, Ruby. No, wait, it's, it, it must have had been there because, uh, where is it? Where's that Ruby process? Oh, there it is. Right, um, because I, I gave the, uh, the, the tool here the PID of that Ruby process, so if I ran another one, it wouldn't be tracing that. In any case, um, so here's a, a Ruby shell, and let me do just a print high. And let's see what gets allocated as I do that. So switching back uh, over here, I hit Control C. This is what the Ruby REPL has allocated in order to print high to the console. Um, now you see for some types, I don't get the, the object size, only the count. So we had to allocate these many objects of that type and this one. We also had to allocate 31 arrays and 171 strings <laughs> to print high to the console. I know it's impressive. Any Ruby users here? Okay, you can, you can raise your hand, it's, um, sorry. So, um, right, uh, another a final, a final example I wanna show you, I wanna also leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, so one more example I wanna show you from these uh, user space tools um, I've been uh, working on. This tool here is called uCalls, and what it does is it traces method calls. Um, it also has support for several high-level languages and system calls, Linux system calls. And what it does is it basically traces the entry and exit from each method and uh, uh, counts the number of invocations and the duration of that call. This is a high overhead tool. It's, it's not meant for production use. Um, it's mostly meant for developing, for testing, uh, but it still can be pretty useful and you don't need a full-blown profiler. Uh, for, for that. So let me run this one. Uh, yeah, I need a Java process uh, for that. So here's a little Java process, and you'll note I have on my Java uh, command line over here an extended flag called extended dtrace probes. Uh, if I don't do that, Java doesn't report, the JVM doesn't report method entry and exit. So I do have to turn that on. And now let's just uh, run this guy. Mm, fail to enable probe. Right, so I probably should skip that. Uh, let me just try something. Uh, I do want to see if I can just trace the, uh, the actual event directly. Uh, just to show you an example of what that looks like. So let's, let's first see in that Java process um, where the JVM is coming from. Uh, oh, I, I actually have to, to type this whole thing or copy it, right? So this is where uh, my, my uh, JVM lives. So yeah, I'm gonna skip that. But basically, in that shared object, in the JVM shared object, there is a, uh, a bunch of static trace points like that. Some of these are for garbage collection and object allocation and J and I, and there is a trace point which uh, that uCalls program can use. There's a trace point for method entry and exit. So essentially, we use the BPF infrastructure to connect to method entry and exit in that Java process. Oops. Um, and then we just have to count uh, the number of times each method got called and the duration. Again, importantly, it's not based on pushing all that data to user space for analysis. It's, uh, it's happening in the kernel, the whole aggregation, and we're only pushing out to user space uh, the results. And you know, the results are the method, the number of calls, and the duration, which is even if you have like a thousand methods or a, a, a million methods, it's not that much data uh, to push out. 
So I, I do want to just show you one final tool, which is again little low level, um, but it, it shows a nice capability that we uh, that's built into BCC, uh, and that's histograms. So I'm running BioLatency here, which is a tool that traces um, I/O operations, block I/Os, and it tries to figure out a histogram of uh, frequent. Uh, durations for I.O. operations. So it's called B.I.O. latency for block I.O. operation latencies. Um, so hopefully some I.O. operations just happened, and then I hit Control C, and I get a histogram. Uh, let me just make that histogram fit. Okay, um, so you see over here a histogram, an ASCII histogram, where what we're measuring is the number of microseconds for that block I.O. operation to complete. And then we have bins in that histogram going 0 to 1, 2 to 3, 4 to 7, 8 to 15. The number of events in each bin and the visual representation of that as a histogram that you sort of turn uh, on its side. Um, so you see here we had 59 I.O. operations taking anywhere between half a millisecond and a, a full millisecond, and 12 operations anywhere between an eighth and a fourth of a millisecond, and so on. So uh, these histograms are pretty useful, obviously, uh, more useful than averages and just min-max results, and we can generate them pretty easily in, in BPF. And again, the only thing that gets passed to user space is this data, like the bins and the number of events in each bin. We're not pushing to user space millions of events just to generate that histogram after the fact. So this is, again, uh, a very powerful capability we have uh, built in. So a lot of the tracing tools you know and love today can already be or have already been replaced uh, by BCC alternatives, and truly the only problem is that you need a fairly recent kernel to use a lot of these tools. But it's definitely coming uh, to, for, for and to everyone. So let me just briefly wrap up, and there's some questions here, and you even rated some of these, great. Um, so just a quick wrap up. Tracing, which is what I focused in this talk, um, can be a very useful technique for just investigating what the system is doing, for actually figuring out concrete performance problems or bugs without using a debugger, without using a profiler, without attaching anything very invasive to your system, uh, without restarting your system, of course. Um, some of the tools I've shown you have higher overhead and some have lower overhead, and I tried to focus on that because I think for people doing performance work, the overhead criteria is extremely, are extremely important. Um, flame graphs, which we saw along the way, are a very useful way to visualize stack traces, and uh, histograms, which we also saw, are a very useful way to visualize latencies. Visualization is what I'm saying is also very, very important uh, for performance work, for tracing, and there's a lot of uh, visual front ends which I haven't talked about available for some of these tools. And hopefully you see that BPF, due to the way it works, is truly the new superpower for Linux tracing, and hopefully all of us will be using it uh, in the very near future. Um, I do want to draw just a final analog for people uh, with uh, a lot of uh, Unix Linux experience. Uh, I bet some of you have, have been thinking, is this the trace? Is this the trace for Linux? Um, and so, yeah, probably, that's what it is. This is probably Dtrace for Linux, and Dtrace has similar capabilities and has been available on SunOS for like 15 years, uh, well, less, 10 years, um, and we are finally getting something uh, similar and compatible on Linux as well, which makes me very, very happy. Um, so I'm just going to put this slide here with a lot of references. Uh, you, you can review that later. You can grab the presentation from over here and also from my Twitter. Uh, and let me just take a look at some of these questions. Uh, could you give a short overview as to how to implement trace points in applications, e.g. are there libraries? So yes, um, there's a, basically a very simple header file called sdt.h. Uh, you get that by installing a package. Um, so um, on, on Ubuntu, it's called system tap SDT devel, whatever, just search for SDT, uh, statically defined tracing. Um, so you can embed trace points then uh, very easily if you're doing C or C++. Uh, if you're using higher level languages, you will need a, a gateway to these, uh, uh, to, to these functions. Um, 
It's essentially based on placing in your binary file, like your executable, your shared object, uh, placing information about which trace points you have available and what the addresses for these are. Um, so making it work for C and C++ is a lot easier because addresses are fixed. And for higher level languages, addresses are not fixed um, and you'd need a little something slightly different. Um, if you, if you want to do that, just, just talk to me later. Um, what, is there something funny here? Uh, oh, okay. Does Angular 2 still do dirty checking? Yeah, so there is an Angular talk in the other room, and I really appreciate that you're here and not there. Anyway, I, I, I don't know, I guess, maybe. I <laughs> So, uh, how is Windows in comparing to tracing in Linux, tracing for C-sharp method calls? So, uh, I, I have uh, more years of Windows uh, behind me than Linux, and uh, unfortunately, I must say that Windows is behind. Um, so, Windows has very powerful static tracing available, which is called ETW, Event Tracing for Windows, uh, but there is nothing like K-probes or U-probes. Uh, there's no dynamic tracing that you could just add to the system while it's running uh, without making any code changes. Still, uh, for .NET, for example, specifically, there are uh, profiling tools uh, like uh, the JetBrains profilers, the Redgate profilers, which can get you information on every method call. Um, there's also a cool open source project called uh, CodeCup, uh, Cold Cup, which you could use to attach uh, .NET code to arbitrary .NET methods, so you could do some tracing like that yourself. Uh, so there's some solutions available for specific cases, but there's nothing in the kernel that's as powerful as what we have uh, in Linux. Um, okay, uh, right, a lot of people wonder about Angular dirty checking. Flame graphs for processes without root permissions possible. Uh, so, no, not right now, at least for CPU stacks. To collect the, uh, to collect the original data, we do need root um, at this time. Uh, is BPF Turing complete? Uh, so, yes, there's if and go to, so you're saying it is, but no, uh, these cannot go backwards. Uh, so you can't do backward jumps. Uh, it is true that you can do go to, but only forward. And so you can't do loops of arbitrary length, and so no. Um, from which programming languages we can trace method calls? Um, so C, C++, obviously, and then uh, Java, uh, um, Ruby, uh, for sure, Python, and uh, maybe others, but these are the ones uh, that come up right now. It's ba it basically boils down to whether the runtime for that language has implemented any uh, static trace points for figuring out when a method is called and uh, when the method returns. And the languages I just mentioned do have that support. I should note, uh, they have that support, but sometimes you do have to like compile them from source with a certain flag. Uh, so for example, for uh, Node, a lot of the stuff I showed you would require on standard Linux to grab the Node sources and build it with a flag called with dtrace. Um, and then you'd get uh, the trace points needed. So um, it's not always just uh, you know install a package and you get this out of the box. But for Java, for example, it's just part of the Open JDK for for quite a while now. Um, what's the full short link to the slides? It is truncated. Really? No, I made a mistake. What's that? I made a mistake. Okay, cool. So this is that's the that's the link. Right. Uh, so we have about two minutes to go if there's any uh, last minute questions from you. What's that? Yes, okay, thank you for reminding me. I am, in fact. <laughs> Um, no, I was even asked to remind you as well. I'm doing a workshop on this on Sunday. Uh, so if you're still around if you're, and if you're interested, there's going to be... So basically, we'll be doing a, a lot of this stuff um, uh, live through hands-on labs. And even if you're not there, and I'll be ha very happy to see you there, uh, you might find the hands-on labs useful. Um, and that's just on my GitHub. It's, uh, it's free. Um, so if you want to try some of these tools out and you can't wait for Sunday even, you can, you can get started already. Yes, just raise your voice a little. 
So the demos, uh, like all the command lines I ran, are on the slides in the notes. So you can find them there. And if, if you have any questions, you can get in touch. Um, I'll be very happy to help. This is something I've been very excited about for, for a while, um, and I'm very happy to share it with people, uh, especially people who love performance work and tracing and that kind of thing, and appreciate that over Angular. <laughs> right. Okay, well, I hope you enjoy the rest of Build Stuff, and thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Yeah.